This message is entitled, Freedom Isn't Free, Just As Not Everyone Gets Into Heaven. There's a lie that's been perpetrated for probably close to two decades, maybe even going on three decades in our nation here in these great United States of America, a country which I love, a country which I've been a part of for 61 years, a country which I served for six years, a country which my father, a number of my uncles, my brother, my brother-in-laws, brothers-in-law, grandparents, and many others in my family have served honorably. We didn't give of ourselves because we took our citizenship here lightly. We gave of ourselves some much more than others, some during wartime, some during peacetime, some during both. We didn't give of ourselves because it was a thing to do. We gave of ourselves because we believed, and do still for those of us that are still alive, in the principles that our founding fathers agreed upon after lengthy prayer in that Second Continental Congress, which gave us our Constitution of the United States of America, a document which we should hold so dear that the only one that should stand above it in our minds as citizens of the United States of America should be the Holy Bible itself. Because the Holy Bible, the Word of God, was the foundation upon which that document was written. There is a lie today being perpetrated that there are no illegal people. There are bumper stickers, t-shirts, window stickers, memes, you name it, it's all out there. Folks, this is a lie from the pit of hell. In John 8, 44, the Lord Jesus says, speaking to the Pharisees, speaking to those who try to manipulate the law or say we can keep it under our own power, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Here's the truth, friends. People who act illegally are called criminals. The root word for criminal is crime. You have broken the law. You have fallen short of what the law requires of you. You are doing something that is illegal. And therefore, you are now a criminal. You have violated the tenets of the law of a municipality, of a county, of a state, of a nation. And you are now a criminal. So the first statement is a complete red herring. It's non sequitur. It doesn't follow any reasonable rule. People who do things that are wrong are called wrongdoers. People who, are, who rob are called robbers. People who commit crimes are called criminals. And people who do things that are not legal are called illegals. People who do not belong in a nation are called aliens because they come from somewhere else. And I know this sounds hard. And I know some of you are probably ready to turn this message off right now. I'm sorry. This is the truth. I'm not sorry that it's the truth. I'm sorry that some of you may not be able to handle it. But this is God's word. This is not my word. This is not the preaching patriot's word. This is not the doctrine of Jack Burton. This is the doctrine of God. 
And I'm going to show you that over the next 30 minutes or so. A sovereign nation is a picture of our sovereign Lord. And by the way, the Lord tells us in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you choose to live in a lie, so be it. But you'll always live in bondage because you'll always be trying to figure out how to justify the next lie. Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, or the church at Rome, in Romans 13, verses 3 and 4, for rulers, and that is leaders, are not a terror to good works. And he's speaking expressly here about righteous rulers, godly rulers. They may not necessarily know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but they are ruling from a righteous platform, from a moral platform. They're not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will they then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, that is, approval. For he is the minister, and that is servant. That word minister simply means servant. What a misused word that is today. Minister does not mean pastor. Minister does not mean overseer of a church. It means a servant. Friends, if you're if you are saved, bought by Christ's blood, washed in the blood, born again, you are a minister of Christ. You're also an ambassador of Christ. That means you've been sent out to be one of his, to give the message to the world. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, that is, break the law, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. He wields the power. In the Bible, the sword is a symbol of one who wields power and authority. And he doesn't wield it in vain. He doesn't, he doesn't have an empty hand. He doesn't hold it for no purpose. For he is the minister of God. This is the second time he says it. It must be pretty important. A revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. He is the one or his administration, or whatever the ruling body is, they have the authority to execute justice and judgment upon those that break the law. Now, when people who are supposed to be in charge abrogate that responsibility, that is, they ignore it, or they make excuses why they shouldn't be doing what they're supposed to do, the nation suffers. And then it becomes the nation's responsibility to step up and hold their leadership to account. That's what is supposed to take place. And it is the church's position to pray and to call upon the Lord to move with his mighty hand to move the people to do what is right. And we learn in the Old Testament that when we pray for those that are doing wrong, specifically our enemies, and we bless them, there's one of two things that's going to happen. First of all, we're told that we heap coals of fire upon their head. And that can have one of two results, because fire purifies. So it may cause them to see the error of their ways and repent and turn from their wicked ways, calling a once sinner or a once enemy to salvation and becoming an ally. Or it may utterly destroy them and cause them to perish where they stand because they've fought against the Lord and God. Either way, the Lord wins. Now, we don't wish for the second one. We're not to desire that people be vanquished. We're to desire that evil is vanquished, but we're not to desire that the people be vanquished. We should have compassion on every human being, no matter how evil and no matter how vile they have acted. 
because they've been deceived. But when they choose that point where they've gone over into a reprobate mind, even God says, okay, Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and following, okay, I'm giving you over to a reprobate mind. You will suffer the consequences. You will live in the consequences of your choices. If you do come back to me, I will receive you. If you repent of everything, I will accept you as one of my children. I will save you through the blood of Jesus Christ. I will do that. But as long as you live in this heinous, sinful manner, I'm going to let you suffer the consequences of your actions. And don't call on me for protection as long as you wish to live that way. That's basically what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, following verse 20. The Lord Jesus Christ also tells us through the power of his Holy Spirit and the Apostle Paul elsewhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 5 that when we do things on this earth, we're either doing them for the Lord Jesus Christ or that we're doing them uselessly. If we're not doing them for the kingdom of heaven, then they're useless. And if we're doing things so heinous, he says in chapter 5, that they shouldn't even be spoken of among Christians, among the saints, and Christians are saints. There's no special thing you need to do to become a saint. When you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are set apart, sanctified, holy. The word is huias, okay? And you become a saint. That's all the word means in Scripture. When you become a saint, God says you are to behave as one. You're to serve him. If you go off and you do something really crazy and heinous like they were doing in in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'll leave it to you to look that up and see what they were doing. It was pretty terrible. He said, you continue in this and I'll give your bodies over to Satan. You're saved. You can't lose your salvation. But I'll call you out of the pool. I'll let Satan have your body. He can destroy it. In other words, you'll die. I'll let the body be destroyed so I can bring your I can bring your spirit home. Because I won't let your spirit live in that corrupt body. I won't do it. I won't let you desecrate the name of my son and your savior in that manner. God is serious about salvation. He is serious as a heart attack about salvation, and you better believe it. And that's one of the ways, and that fact, that's one of the main ways that he illustrates his sovereignty. And we, as a nation here in the United States, have utterly abrogated our sovereignty. We seem to think sovereignty is a joke, and our nation is a playground. And we have made no difference between our citizens and the citizens of the world. We had a president in the not-too-distant past who said that he was a citizen of the world, not president of the United States. I'm not going to name him by name, but a brief search will help you find out who that individual was. And that's wrong. A leader of a nation, whether it's Sri Lanka or India or China or or Bolivia or Canada, Each one of those leaders is a sovereign leader of a sovereign nation. That's why nations have borders, why nations have national laws. And you think, well, you've been spouting off an awful lot. Is there something in the Bible that talks about this exclusivity of a nation, exclusivity of salvation? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because in Scripture, there are a myriad of references to salvation being exclusive to a very specific group of people. In other words, there's only a specific way that you can be saved, just like there's only a specific way that you should be able to come into a nation and become assimilated as a part of that nation. You see, there was a time when America was called the Great Melting Pot. And the reason we were called the Great Melting Pot is it didn't matter if you came from Poland, or if you came from Italy, or if you came from Ireland, where a large contingent of my family comes from, or if you came across the Bering Strait 
over a thousand years ago, roughly 1500 years ago, maybe. And you were part of the large contingent of over 600 American Indian tribes, of which I also have some of that blood running through my veins. It doesn't matter which background you have, which ethnic background or whatever, you are now an American citizen. You're a citizen of the United States of America. If you come from Mexico and you want to celebrate some Mexican holidays here in the United States, have at it. I'll join in. I love Mexican holidays. Not all of them, but some of them I do. If you want, if you're from Italy and you want to enjoy some Italian holidays while you're here in the United States, after you've gotten your citizenship, you've gotten your green card, you've been naturalized, you've done it the right way, have at it. I've been, I used to go to celebrations in Little Italy down, downtown, downtown Baltimore, where I grew up. Loved it. If you're from Ireland and you want to celebrate Irish holidays, I used to go celebrate several Irish holidays during the year down in Baltimore. Baltimore, by the way, at one time was called Charm City. It's got another nickname now, which I won't share with you. And it was a great melting pot of many, many ethnicities. And it was wonderful. You could go right downtown and learn about so much of the world right down within minutes of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. And people were drawn together because we were still all Americans. We weren't Italians. We weren't Jews. We weren't, um, we weren't Poles. We weren't Irishmen. We weren't this and that. You know, we, we looked at the backgrounds and the ethnicities, but we were all Americans and proud to be here. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we give up our worldly identity and our worldly life to become Christians. We are no longer citizens of the world. We are now citizens of heaven. I don't call myself a worldly Christian. In fact, that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a worldly Christian. A worldly Christian is not a Christian. You can't be. So I'm going to share with you seven specific exclusives that the Bible speaks of, both in Old and New Testament, that deal with salvation and show you that God is very, very divisive. And when I say divisive, I don't mean that he's trying to be trying to divide people among themselves. He's not trying to create unity. I mean, he's very divisive when it comes to those who obey and those that don't, when it comes to those that answer the call and those that don't, when it comes to those who are his and those who are not, when it comes to those who are citizens of heaven and are allowed entry therein, and when it comes to those who are not. And it is a perfect parallel to the sovereignty of a nation. First one, Psalm 62, 2. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. There is only one who is in whom there is salvation. That is the Lord God. This is King David writing. Number two, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. This is the Lord God himself, Jehovah, in his pre-incarnate form. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. In his pre-incarnate form, before he came on earth as a man, speaking to the prophet Isaiah, saying, I'm the Lord. There is no other God. There is no other Savior. There is no other Savior. There's only one. Number three, Jonah 2.9. Jonah was a rebel from the start. And he was even angry that God didn't destroy Nineveh at the end. But listen to what he says here in Jonah 2.9. But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. 
He doesn't say salvation is of the Lord plus something or salvation is of the Lord and then I can do something else or salvation is of the Lord and then I'll keep on working to, to, to keep my salvation going. It's of the Lord. No one or nothing else. Number four, we'll move into the New Testament. Matthew seven thirteen and 14. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Enter ye at the straight gate. That word straight there simply means very narrow. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go thereat. Because straight, or narrow, is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There is a specific way to become a citizen of these United States of America. My ancestors did it. My wife's ancestors did it. Millions upon millions of citizens are here today because their ancestors did it. Now we have millions and millions of people crossing our borders in just the last decade, just the last half decade. We don't even know where they are, what they're doing. Yes, some are coming here for a better life, but many are not. They are literally spitting upon the graves of the people who worked and slaved and toiled, sometimes for decades, to become naturalized American citizens so that their future generations could know a better life. And everyone who is a child of an immigrant, and that's an awful lot of us, an awful lot of us, in fact, most of us, unless your folks came over on on the Mayflower or somewhere before Ellis Island was opened up, you should give this some hard thought about what's going on right now in our nation. John 14, 6. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ again. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus in a blanket statement right there is saying, you don't get into heaven unless you come through this door. And by the way, Jesus calls himself the door. He is the door. He is the great shepherd. And you don't get in unless you go by him, unless you go through him. He has to open and allow you in. That's it. That's how narrow the pathway is. The pathway is so narrow, one man stands in the gap. When you know him, you have entry. You don't know him, forget it. Acts 4.12. Peter is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you read the entire passage in Acts chapter 4. And he says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's one name, one name only. Just like there is one way and one way only. Salvation is incredibly exclusive. God says this is the only way you can get into heaven. There is no other way. You can make up all the religions in the world you want to. Same thing with citizenship. You can come into the nation any way you want to, but you are not a legitimate citizen, legitimate citizen unless you come in the way our law prescribes. And every nation in the world, every nation in the world, has rules for how you become a citizen. Why are we abrogating our responsibility? Finally, Seventh one, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus and Jesus alone provides the way to salvation. The U.S. Constitution and its bylaws alone, federal law and federal law alone, makes the rules and the regulations for becoming a citizen. There aren't any other ways. And yes, amnesty is part of it. 
Amnesty has been made an excuse for allowing people to come across our borders en masse. But amnesty is supposed to be the great exception to the rule. Our first responsibility is to our citizens, just like Jesus' first responsibility is to the kingdom of Christ. What is the right way? We are all welcome to enter into God's kingdom. The world is welcome to apply for citizenship here in the United States. But when you seek salvation in Christ Jesus, you can only seek it in the manner he has decreed. In John 4.24, he said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You can't worship him any other way. And if you're going to worship him in spirit and in truth, you can't try to backdoor your way into heaven because it won't work. It's the same thing with doing something that is legal and right. All others who seek to come in another way are insincere, they're liars, and they're mockers of his grace. And those that are coming into our nation right now who are trying to come in every other way that they can, well, you know what? They're taking advantage of an opportunity that's being given to them by leaders who are no more leaders than some things that I should not mention in polite company or even in impolite company because God says that we are not to use, that we are to shun profane and vain babbling. So I'm not going to use any kind of improper language. But it's wrong. It's just wrong. Jesus says in, in one of his parables, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 11 through 14, and this is the parable of the marriage feast. And when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man there which had not on a wedding garment. And he, sa he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. The man couldn't speak. And the king asked him a question. He doesn't can't tell him why he's not ready, why he's not dressed properly. Then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And of course, that's a metaphor for hell. For many are called, but few are chosen. And that expression, for many are called, but few are chosen, simply means this. Some people try to make way too much out of that. Salvation is broadcast to the world. We're preaching it all the time. Here I am preaching it right now. We're preaching salvation to the world all the time. Who are chosen? The ones who respond. The ones who respond with humility and in truth. Our doors here in the United States have been open for a long time for people to become citizens the right way. We have work visas. We have student visas. We have temporary work visas. We have extended work visas. We have opportunities for people to come here while they live in another country, decide whether they want to be a citizen or not. Over time, decide maybe they do. They have a whole naturalization process they can go through where they can learn about our, our nation. Some of them have risen uh, up to actually become staffers in the White House, actually be risen up to be in the cabinet in the White House. Others have gone on to do various other things throughout the nation. You can be whatever you want to be and do whatever you want to do. The problem is we have leadership right now that has abrogated its responsibility to be the godly rulers spoken of in the book of Romans. That's what we need to pray for, friends. We need to pray for godly leadership. Even if that leadership does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for them to follow in his footsteps. And remember, Jesus offers this invitation. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But he doesn't say, come unto me, and bring all your baggage with you. 
and come any way you want to and stay that way. There's nothing in Scripture that says that. He says you lay your burden down. You throw your baggage away. You turn around and you walk another way. You leave your citizenship on earth behind and you become a citizen of the great king of heaven. And we, as American citizens, should demand no less of those that want to enjoy the benefits that we for so long have enjoyed and are now losing because our leadership has abrogated its responsibility to protect us first. Until next time, friends, stay in his word and stay true to his word. In Christ's undying love, amen.